We'll start with an introduction on what 3D cell culturing is and why you would want to use it, followed by examples of 3D cell culturing and analysis using our 3D cell culturing kits. We'll end by addressing some common troubleshooting problems with hydrogel-based 3D cultures and finish with additional members of the Science Cell R&D team for a live Q&A session. Our presentation will feature some of Science Cell's inclusive 3D cell culturing kits for endothelial cell analyses that include everything from the cells to the gels that you need to get started on your 3D-based research. As a courtesy, please save your questions and comments for the Q&A at the end of the presentation. You can also use the chat function to ask questions during the presentation, but all questions will be addressed at the end. If you have a question regarding something specific in the presentation, please note the relevant slide number, which will be located in the upper right corner of each slide so we can reference it. Following the close of the Q&A, you'll be able to take a short survey about your webinar experience and your research needs. 3D cell culturing is cell culturing that utilizes the depth dimension, or the z-plane, in contrast to to traditional 2D monolayer culturing, which only utilizes the X and Y planes. It is still entirely in vitro, meaning it uses an artificial growing environment, but cells are allowed to grow in a 3D substrate, and cell-cell and cell-ECM interactions are 360 degrees. In addition, the 3D substrate can be formulated or architected to promote certain physiological functions. 3D cell cultures come in two basic varieties, scaffold-dependent and scaffold-independent. Scaffold-dependent cultures rely on natural or synthetic matrices to form the ECM. Examples of scaffolds include hydrogels and hard scaffolds. Hydrogels can be natural or synthetic in origin and are polymer networks swollen with water. They are popular among researchers studying cells from tissues that serve barrier functions or have bilayer structures since it allows such properties to be exhibited in culture. Hard scaffolds include polymeric structures that have been prefabricated by such means as 3D printing to create interstices in which cells can grow. The main scaffold-independent type of 3D cell culture is the spheroid, whereby cells are grown in suspension, typically in specialized media formulated for such growth. This can be achieved by using low adhesion culturing dishes or by using the hanging droplet technique as depicted here. Cells grown using this method aggregate in multicellular structures and secrete their own ECM where they then live. This culturing technique is particularly useful for those studying cancer or stem cells. Microfluidics typically involves culturing cells on some sort of scaffolding and transporting fluid volumes from region to region to mimic flow, shear stress, and perfusive forces. On the cell culture, oh, sorry, perfusive forces on the cell cultures all while replenishing nutrients and removing waste products in a timely manner. Finally, bioreactors enable high volume production, typically of non-adherent cells, although the use of microcarriers is emerging for culturing adherent ones. Bioreactors can also be used for tissue engineering. These are but a sample of the current 3D technologies and the different platforms can be combined to yield even more intricate systems. There's definitely a drive toward 3D platforms and technologies for it are being developed and improved. Science Cell has chosen to focus its efforts on developing hydrogel kits for 3D culturing for now because we find it to be the most versatile with the best balance of user friendliness, affordability, and elegance. As such, while applicable to other platforms, the rest of this presentation will be given with hydrogels in mind. Before we talk more in depth about specific ways to use them, let's talk first about why you would want to use them at all. 
In terms of in vitro cultures, 3D has many advantages over 2D. Because traditional 2D culturing is typically on a rigid surface and interface is limited to one side of the cell, cell morphology is drastically altered in 2D cultures as compared to their tissue counterparts. In 2D, cells are flatter since they are allowed to spread uninhibited by ECM, and because of this, their surface to volume ratio, geometry, and cytoskeletal architecture are also altered. In addition, because they only interface with ECM on one side, they acquire a forced polarity, which leads to atypical membrane or basement membrane production and inter intracellular signaling. Having altered morphology and forced polarity in 2D culturing then has the unfortunate side effects of leading to aberrant cell division and dedifferentiation. All of these effects are largely mitigated by having an ECM that surrounds the cell as in 3D cell cultures. So mechanotransduction, it's, uh, it's how the cell senses and converts mechanical stimuli into electrochemical signaling and um, this is drastically altered in traditional 2D cultures since the two, um, for multiple reasons. Uh, one is because it's the ECM is not dynamic and it's also very rigid, it's very hard, so it's not easily remodeled. Um, the mechanical input into the cells is therefore like way more than you would see normally. So these effects are again largely mitigated by culturing the cells in a soft 3D matrix that the cells can remodel on their own terms. All right. <laughs> In addition, um, both cell-cell and cell-ECM contact is limited to singular surfaces in 2D cultures, and co-cultured cells can only interact indirectly through factors released into the culturing medium. In contrast, cells experience uninhibited cell-cell and cell-ECM contact in 3D cultures forming multicellular structures that have been shown to have different gene expression patterns and cell signaling activities from their 2D counterparts. Co-cultured cells can even interact directly sharing a basement membrane as endothelial cells and parasites have been shown to do. Inherent to the design of 2D culturing, microenvironments cannot be established since factors diffuse directly and evenly into the liquid medium, and because of the even distribution of factors and nutrients through the liquid medium, 2D cultures are poor models for hypoxia or toxicity studies. Meanwhile, 3D ECMs are able to retain soluble factors enabling the establishment of microenvironments and their consequently better hypoxia and toxicity models. Finally, because 2D culturing environments are relatively stressful for cells, their resultant hypersensitivity to drug treatments make 2D a poor model for drug resistance testing. Cells cultured in 3D are better supported, so they have greater predictive value in drug resistance testing. 3D can also be used to complement in vivo studies. Because in vitro parameters are easier to control and manipulate than in vivo, 3D offers an excellent method for validating or testing specific signaling or mechanistic aberrancies as causes for in vivo phenotypes. Conversely, for researchers endeavoring to determine if a specific signaling pathway or mechanism has any influence on a more global scale, 3D offers a more complex system to triage 2D results into those more likely to have in vivo effects. You can also combine 3D methods and in vivo modeling with plug assays whereby hydrogel is subcutaneously implanted into a living organism, recovered at a later date, and analyzed histologically for vasculature growth or invading cells. Indeed, 3D cell culturing provides advantages to most types of research. 
For those doing biochemical, cellular, and molecular work, the functional retention and increased relevance of 3D cultures lends credence to your data because tissues are 3D. For those doing cancer research, 3D cultures allow you to look closely at matrix modeling for metastasis and invasion studies. They also provide a method by which you can recreate and examine tumor microenvironments. On the translational and clinical side, cells cultured in 3D formats have greater predictive value in drug resistance and cytotoxicity assays. So given all these advantages, why isn't everyone doing 3D cell culturing? 3D cultures tend to be more involved technically, time-wise, and monetarily than their 2D counterparts. In terms of designing your 3D experiments, multiple additional parameters need to be considered, such as your ECM composition. How soft or hard does it have to be? How porous? What pore size? Natural or synthetic components? Which components? All of these can affect how soluble factors are sequestered and transported in the ECM, and all of these can affect how your cells behave or remodel the ECM. You'll need to consider initial seeding density too, because too few or too many cells can lead to such things as less than ideal intercellular signaling or overgrowth of the entire system. Culturing conditions is another factor to consider as 3D culturing requirements will likely be different from 2D ones. Does the media have the right concentration of growth factors? Are the salts in the right ratios? Are all required growth factors present? Beyond the technical details and cost, 3D experiments take longer to perform because cells need more time to do things like remodel the ECM to spread or move. Add to all that the hurdles of gathering all necessary reagents and imaging 3D structures for quantification. We'll talk now about how Science Cell 3D Kits addresses some of these concerns. While there are many 3D kits on the market, we consider ours to be more streamlined and inclusive. Our kits come with all components necessary to get you started on your 3D cultures, including the primary cells, specialty maintenance media, serum-free 3D culturing medium, and detailed protocols. For the purposes of this section, we'll be focusing on our endothelial tubule formation kits, which utilize rat tail collagen 1 as a hydrogel scaffold since collagen 1 is highly represented in vascular ECM. There are at least two ways to use hydrogels in 3D cell culturing as depicted here in light blue and blue, and we have kits for both of these. Briefly, this middle column titled Enhanced 2D is basically a gel sandwich where a monolayer of cells is cultured between two hydrogel layers. The embedded 3D column on the right is a true 3D culture where cells are interspersed throughout the hydrogel. The advantages between both blue shaded methods and traditional 2D in white have already been discussed. So I'd like to turn your attention to these differences between the enhanced 2D and the embedded 3D, highlighted in a peachy orange color. You would choose one method over the other based on your objective, and we'll go into more depth about how these differences translate into results. Science Cell has endothelial 3D kits that utilize both of these methods using the included cells, so we'll use them as examples on how to get the most out of these experiments. First, the Enhanced 2D Model, also known as Gel Sandwiches. Done in a 24-well plate, the 3D sandwich is a fairly straightforward platform and basically involves polymerizing a thick bottom gel layer, trypsinizing, counting, and seeding your cells, waiting until they attach to overlay your cells with the second thick gel layer, waiting until that polymerizes, 
and then adding your culturing medium for maintenance. Our 3D endothelial network formation kit 8718 uses this model and you can see that the included HUVEC sandwich between two rat tail collagen 1 gels cultured in the included serum free 3D medium yield fairly advanced networks four days post sandwiching. The basic progression with our 8718 kit using endothelial cells starts with a confluent monolayer followed by cell migration and reorganization after the top gel layer is added. Endothelial morphogenesis, branching, and network formation then occur for the next few days and the assay terminates on day four with some remodeling and rudimentary cord pruning. The top row is immunofluorescent images of GFP expressing HUVEC and the bottom row is regular light microscopy images of kit 8718 using the included HUVEC. Once you have a network, you can start analyzing it by colorimetrically staining it with staining grade crystal violet or a tetrazoleum salt like MTT. Once col colorimetrically stained, you can manipulate the image in something like Photoshop to get a black and white skeleton uh, for quantifying various parameters using free online software. For example, after adjusting the threshold to select for the black pixels that represent your network, you can quantify network surface area coverage using ImageJ. Using the Angiogenesis plugin, you can also quantify the number of branch points. One of the main advantages of culturing cells this way is to produce morphology that is much closer to in vivo phenotypes compared with traditional 2D culturing. This is true for cells other than endothelial cells. For example, hepatocytes cultured in a sandwich assay have been shown to form bile canaliculi highlighted here by MRP2 staining in green, whereas hepatocytes cultured using traditional 2D methods do not. That same study and similar studies have shown improved and increased hepatocyte function when cultured in a collagen gel sandwich. Switching gears, we're now going to talk about the embedded 3D model. We currently have two endothelial kits that utilize this model, one that includes only HUVEC for rudimentary um, tubule formation and one that includes both HUVEC and parasites for more advanced tubule formation and pruning. We'll be releasing a third kit soon that includes HUVEC, parasites, and astrocytes for an embedded triculture model to approximate interactions at the blood-brain barrier. To explain how the 3D embedded model works, we'll be using our endothelial parasite co-culturing kit 8728 as an example. The embedded assay starts with a cell pellet. In the case of our co-culturing kit, the included endothelial cells and parasites would be detached counted, and then combined into one tube for one mixed cell type pellet. It's important to count your cells through this assay and to aliquot them appropriately because the proper ratio of endothelial cells to parasites, or general density of cells, is critical for proper tubule formation. Meanwhile, in a separate tube, you would have all your gel components except the gelling agent mixed and ready to go. In the case of our endothelial parasite co-culturing kit, the gel would be rat tail collagen 1. Once the gelling agent is added, the mixed cell pellet is immediately resuspended in the gel and plated as a bubble or a dot in the middle of a well from a 24 well plate. The gel at this point is viscous enough to keep the cells randomly suspended throughout the gel. After the gel polymerizes, culturing medium is added to the well, and the assay progresses for at least six days. At the beginning of this assay, 
you'll see cells starting to elongate, elongate and migrate toward each other. As the assay progresses, cells will remodel the ECM, form multicellular structures, sprout, and branch. Eventually, these tube-like structures will start forming nascent lumens while parasite investment contributes to pruning and directed migration of endothelial structures. At the assay's termination, the gel can be fixed, permeabilized, and stained for immunofluorescent analysis. This particular image was taken by fixing and staining an 8728 gel dot for endothelial marker CD31 using our 3D gel staining prep kit, 8808. High magnification using regular light microscopy gives you views of rudimentary lumens, and after fixing and staining with the 3D gel staining prep kit, 8808, you can see parasite investment, tip cell morphology, vesicular trafficking, and tight junctions. To analyze these gel dots, again, you can use free software available online. In this example, researchers used ImageJ with the Sprout Analyzer plugin to quantify both the average length of sprouts and parasite coverage in a bead-based sprouting assay with differential staining. Switching gears again, I'd like to talk briefly about spheroids before concluding our webinar. As I mentioned before, spheroids are the main type of scaffold-independent 3D culture, whereby cells are grown in suspension, typically using low adhesion plates the hanging drop method, or bioreactors. The Science Cell R&D team is working now to develop spheroid systems with specialty medium uh, that's serum-free for your research. The advantages of spheroids over traditional 2D culturing include enhanced cell-specific functional activity, multicellular structures, retention of original proteonomic signatures, having a dynamic ECM, and receiving encompassing input from extracellular stimuli. The photos here depict the same hepatocytes grown in traditional 2D on poly-L lysine and as spheroids on our low adhesion plates. The research highlighted here also reports that hepatocyte spheroids maintain donor individuality, while 2D cultures did not, making hepatocyte spheroids a more useful in vitro model for drug testing than their 2D counterparts. Another group reported that spheroids embedded in a collagen gel, like our previous endothelial gel dot model, maintained their differentiated metabolic activities for over three weeks, and that their albumin and urea production were two to three times higher than traditional 2D cultured models. Indeed, 3D cell culturing methods are very useful, and study after study shows how much more physiologically relevant they are as an in vitro platform but inherent to more intricate systems are additional potential problems. Here are some common problems experienced by novice and expert 3D researchers alike, along with some possible causes and potential solutions to them. We won't go over all of them since it's a lot, but keep in mind that Science Cell's 3D culturing R&D team is dedicated to making your 3D culturing experience as smooth as possible, so we provide personal technical assistance and consultations for those seeking assistance or advice on 3D. It's also worth noting that Science Cell 3D kits take a lot of guesswork out of preparing your experiment since the protocol comes optimized and any included primary cells are low passage and quality control tested. Media included in our kits for culturing or maintaining cells or gels have also been optimized and quality control tested 
and our 3D culturing medium is even serum free. As an aside, if you don't want one of the all-inclusive kits, we also have kits that are just the ECM and gelling components, so you can use them with your own cells and media. This concludes our presentation. You've learned about the advantages and benefits of 3D cell culturing, received an overview on parameters and potential pitfalls to consider when designing your own 3D experiments, how to perform and analyze your 3D experiments, and how Science Cell can enhance your 3D research with its all-inclusive 3D cell culturing kits. If you'd like any more information about the products used and featured in this presentation, here's a list of them. If you feel like you've missed something, want to see something again, or want to share this webinar with your friends, this entire webinar will be available for download and viewing on our website starting tomorrow. Thanks for listening, and we'll take any questions or comments you may have now. Okay, so um, we have one question about um, Matrigel, essentially why don't we use Matrigel for our kits? And um, we do offer um, Angle Breath Home Swarm, the uh, what is essentially Matrigel, but we prefer collagen since it's more defined and we understand it to be more indicative of normal physiological conditions rather than potentially tumorigenic ones um, in terms of accompanying growth and soluble factors. Um, okay, does, um, does the media in science cell kits contain angiogenic factors to promote tube formation? It does. Um, we, they're propri uh, the recipe is proprietary, so I can't give you like concentrations for what's in them, but um, it does contain things like like VEGF, obviously, um, in, in an optimized ratio to promote tube formation that includes um, the ultimate lumen formation. Um, okay, can I use these kits with other cell types? Uh, you can. The ECM and gelling reagents, as I mentioned, they're sold independently. Um, the media is formulated uh, specifically for, for the purpose. So like the, the tube formation ones, the media will be an, like angiogenic based. Um, so you wouldn't be able to use that with other cell types, but the, um, the collagen for sure. Uh, so, like, you would be able to culture your hepatocytes in them. Why do we use HUVEC with brain parasites and astrocytes instead of brain microvascular endothelial cells? That is an excellent question. Um, we use HUVEC for now simply because they're easier and less uh, finicky of a cell type. Um, but our R&D team is working on getting it up and running with the brain microvascular ones. So it's definitely something we're considering. <laughs> um, how are our kits different from published protocols or other kits? Um, so our, our product development starts with extensive literature research and 
it ends with extensive optimization and testing to ensure reproducibility between users. Um, and we, uh, like, we, we make sure that the protocol is easy to follow um, enough so that people not on the 3D R&D team can, can follow it and get reproducible results. Um, so in comparison to other companies' kits or published protocols, our kits offer you the convenience of being all-inclusive all in that they come with the primary cells, the gelling reagents, the serum-free medium, so you don't have to cobble, cobble it all together, and the protocol is written with all those reagents in mind. Um, are there any dyes that are optimized to use with these 3D embedded kits to image tubules formed by HUVEC? Um, so we've been playing around with it a bit, actually. Uh, you can, and, and we're currently optimizing dyes for it. Um, so you may have seen on one of the slides there was the vesicular, the acridine orange. Um, so that's in the works, and um, we'll be uh, putting that out to sell soon um, with the protocol to use uh, for these particular 3D embedded kits. And then um, I mentioned, uh, they're not dyes, but I mentioned the 8808 gel staining prep kit, which is essentially a protocol and reagents to fix and permeabilize your cells so that you can use, um, well, the antibodies we tested uh, work really well with it. So it stains well for CD31, GFAP, NG2, um, and crystal violet and MTT um, are, they're not optimized for it, but if you're just looking at a quick and easy way to look at it, um, you could you could use those to stain the uh, the tub the HUVEC tubules as well, but because those are kind of dirty, you won't be able to really see lumens with those. You'll just be able to see that there are structures there. Um, have we tested with other endothelial cell types? Um, okay, uh, so as I mentioned, we're we are. We started testing with the brain microvascular endothelial cells, and for the kits that you saw, um, they were tested with pulmonary endothelial cells, and they didn't go through the whole gamut of testing, but those did end up forming tube-like structures. Um, if there's a specific type of endothelial cell you're thinking of, um, feel free to, oh, at the close of this uh, presentation, um, a survey will pop up. And the very last question will be for additional comments and questions. Um, so go ahead and uh, type it in there. And I can refer to you to one of our R&D scientists, and they can talk with you specifically about um, what, what you're thinking of. Uh, and also, we didn't really talk about bioreactors. Do we have anything in the pipeline for that? Right now, that's not something um, that's on our immediate radar, no. Uh, would it be possible to extract protein from these 3D cultured cells and testing them with Western blotting? Yeah, so if you go on to PubMed and um, uh, well, you can you can leave your email in the, that last comment box I mentioned on the survey that'll pop up, um, and I can forward you some protocols of how to uh, digest the gels. Uh, essentially, you use collagenase, and um, you can retrieve your cells embedded into the collagen one that way. Uh, alternatively, you can look it up on PubMed, but. Uh, yeah, feel free to contact me about that, and I'll send you the references. Um, do we think 3D culture is suitable for molecular analysis? Um, I, uh, hmm, I'm not 
entirely sure of what um, molecular analysis refers to in this case, um, but with um, if you use high enough magnification, uh, like if you put together Z stacks from confocal imaging, for example, you can definitely see um, organelle trafficking and you can see where proteins are localized. Um, for example, like if you were to stain for a cadherin, you would be able to see those junctions. Um, so in, in those terms, uh, I would say uh, it works well for, for that kind of histological analysis. Um, if I'm not answering the question you had in mind, though, uh, you can ask again and use different words or uh, contact um, me or someone else through um, our tech support or ask the question on that last additional comments and questions box. Um, Okay, we'll give like another minute for any other questions, but if none pop up, I think we'll conclude. Mm, okay, uh, thanks so much for listening and attending. And again, uh, that survey that'll pop up, the, if you don't feel like filling it out, even the very last one is for whatever you want to say, and someone from the R&D team will address it. Uh, thank you. Have a great evening. <laughs>